Welcome, uh, this is Robert Berman. I'm here at my uh, gallery in Santa Monica at Bergamot Station Art Center. And I'm very pleased and proud to have a pop-up exhibition by an artist who I've shown uh, many times over the past 15, 20 years, uh, William Bill Tunberg. And um, it'll be starting in uh, January of uh, 2022. Uh, what's really exciting about Bill's work is that he's been a Venice, California artist since the 60s, working with John L. Toon and a lot of the great artists back in that time but he's continued to do his work and he's only gotten better and better and more original and more uh, prolific at it in the last 15 20 years and uh, right here in this exhibition we're able to show you some of the really newest and the exciting works that uh, Bill's been working on. So, uh, welcome. I opened my first gallery here in Santa Monica back in, seems like decades ago, and actually it is decades ago, back in 1979. And I, uh, the original idea was to just sell European master print works, which is what I was dealing in in Europe, but um, I was inundated by a lot of the Venice artists, local artists, and uh, I've worked with many, many Los Angeles artists and New York artists uh, since then. And right now I'm trying to um, sort of back out of dealing with artists and just deal mainly in the uh, secondary art market, which is interesting and, and a lot easier, to be honest with you. But there's a few artists that I've really enjoyed working with over the years, and uh, Bill Tunberg is one of them, someone who is uh, really interesting, easy to work with, um, funny, um, and, and original. I refuse uh, to use or fuss with cell phones. I just... And he really goes back to the old school of Venice, of, uh, of the feeling of a studio artist trying to just immerse himself into making his art. He's aware that um, he wants it to be in people's homes. And he, in his home, my God, it's, it, they really shine. And as you walk through uh, his home, you will see that he's made it a living place for art, and especially for his art, which goes back to his original drawings, which I've shown over the years and which are incredible but especially for the marquetry work, because the marquetry work he owns, nobody else does this. Nobody else is able to take the patience, the time, and the understanding of the rare woods and how he has to sometimes paint them and sometimes stain them and how he has to cut them all by hand and then place them through the traditional form of marquetry into these unique patterns which he has thought up and made up all by himself. My name is Bill Tunberg. I live in Venice, California. I've been an artist here for ever since the late 60s and um, this is what I continue to do. It, what I do is marquetry, but the first thing that I did out of school was uh, assemblage. 
And I think at the time, you know, some some of the great assemblage artists, uh, you know, it was over overpowering in a way. You know, you, you can't do art, you know, unless you have some sort of original uh, flair or taste for it. And uh, doing assemblage art, which I did up until about 1990, you know, although a lot of those pieces uh, are collected. The, you know, I, I kind of ran out of uh, steam on that because people coming through school, they continued to do assemblage art and it, it, it became almost overwhelming. There was so much competition. I mean, this is the God's truth. So I said, well, I've got to develop something uh, that had a fresh look and something that people just couldn't do. So I turned to marketry and marketry had been in um, demise uh, for you know centuries I mean even though it was very old so I, I decided that was a good thing to try to pursue and what I did was I w looked at old art old marketry I read about old marketry um, and about how they did it and tried to figure out ways that I could improve on on the method that they did and using a lot of modern glues and uh, techniques and you know I made a lot of mistakes you know and had to go back and figure out how to cut the cut the pieces. Marquetry is basically dyed and cut veneers that are assembled or cut into shapes and assembled into uh, recognizable forms. But I figured since there were a couple of people here now that are contemporary that are still following the more traditional look. And so I didn't want to invade that territory, so I decided to do it with my kind of abstraction, which are basically floral and uh, mechanical shapes that are overlaid so that they become abstract so that you can you can kind of identify with them because the, the forms and shape are, are are familiar to you but you're not quite sure what it is so it has a more powerful look because you have to study it and look at it and get a feel for it These are veneers, and they're a 40 second of an inch thick. And this is a, a piece of um, maple that's dyed green. And the, if you'll notice that the dye, it goes all the way through uh, the, the veneer. And you can, um, it's aniline dye, which is the same as watercolor. And it can be sanded forever. Well, not forever, because it's so thin. This is a piece of natural zircote, which is, uh, I like the way it looks, but I don't like the way it, it cuts. It cuts, it breaks very easily. But that's a natural veneer. This is a piece of bird's eye maple, which is dyed turquoise. And again, the, the, uh, it goes all the way through. So when you're sanding, um, Unless you get too ambitious with the sander, it, it, you can get rid of the tape. I work in, in um, rectangles, 18 by 24. And these are some of the things that I cut out of dyed and natural veneer, some of the motifs. Yes, I don't. I don't use a handsaw. <laughs> <laughs> you don't sit and cut each piece like this. No, sometimes. Sometimes you do. Sometimes I do. Probably back in the 
70s, 80s. Yeah, I used, I, I didn't have any power tools. I just did everything with, you know, handsaw. But now when you do a whole cathedral or a it tabernacle. It comes from this. It comes from having a saw like this. Yeah. The biggest mistake people make about uh, what I do is that they assume that it's painting. It's not. These are all veneers, uh, natural and dyed, that are put together in a very intricate manner. And then the whole thing is uh, taped together and then glued onto a, a pre-made form, uh, which may be at, you know solid maple and plywood and things like that. I'll start with uh, the, the probably the simplest design that I have in here. This one here, which I'm pointing at, is called Lovers, and it's really simple. Two uh, V's which are interlocked together. Uh, they're exactly the same size. The marquetry itself is abstracted, but as you'll see that they're mostly uh, leaf forms and um, branches which are overlapped in such a way that they're not readily uh, identifiable. This is a large piece which is made up of acanthus leaves and uh, monstera leaves and uh, parts of those leaves. And the images are then uh, cut, put together, and then cut again, put together, so on and so forth. And they're mounted individually to uh, different depth uh, geometric forms, which are all cut to inter, you know, interfit in a way so that it's like a kind of a, a, a complex puzzle in a, in a sense. And I am very happy with this one because of its, you know, sort of hangs over you and litter here and wherever it is. And it's something that you always look at. Okay, the next one, which is called bouquet, it's a kind of a conical shape, uh, and it's made up of a lot of the same things as the previous one that I talk of, but they're they're laid out a little bit differently because I'm dealing with this long uh, reverse triangle, and then these two shapes, which are actually the same shape, but they're tipped. They're like uh, they're. They're cut and tipped and one, the top one is deeper than the next one and the next one is deeper than the bottom one. And it's sort of a, like a bride's bouquet, you know, that she's holding up against her breast. So that's what that's about. And again, like the previous piece, um, it causes your eye to move around the the surface to follow the paths, you know, that are inside that. You might do that with a, a bouquet if you have a, a, a woman holding a bouquet. You might look at it and see how she holds it and see the lines and of it, how it, you know, it's juxtapositioned against her figure. So that's why that's called bouquet. The next one we're going to look at is the last piece that I did, which is called fan, and I've done a lot of pieces that are shaped a little bit like fans, but this, this particular one, I thought about uh, Japanese fans and um, uh, other fans and other cultures. And what I did with this particular one is that I, I, I tried to give the, create the, the movement of a, of a fan going back and forth and knowing that in most times and in most situations when somebody uses a fan usually its stopping points are usually on the right or on the left and in this case I made it the stopping point on the on the right which creates a kind of a it goes up and then over so the whole thing becomes 
uh, the sections become, uh, each section has its own movement because of course fans are basically cloth or paper or something like that. So um, that was, this was my attempt to uh, use marquetry as a, uh, uh, an adjective for movement and that's what I've done in this case, you know, and, I, and each form is built uh, vertically and raise up or down and then varied in, in size. So that, that's why that one uh, looks the way that it does. So I, I like it. In between the larger wall pieces, I make a lot of uh, small ones. And the small ones, you know, for instance, this cube um, are, are designed especially when I'm, I'm doing um, commission work. And I've done a fair amount of commissions and uh, these, these help me to get to a point in the commission which is, are usually religious commissions. Uh, Chapman University has a um, large interfaith center which is a, a totally separate building from any other building and has like, you know, areas for uh, prayer and areas for uh, lectures and sermons, et cetera, et cetera. And in between th these jobs or these commissions, I get um, ideas by, you know, for the marquetry for the, each, each religion, even though these don't look religious. The thing about these, the smaller pieces is they are uh, more touchable and they're friendlier in a sense than the big pieces. The big pieces uh, are kind of like big statements that are on the wall and you, you know kind of commands the viewer to stand away from them a little bit so he can play with the designs in his mind and follow them around kind of like a, a, a puzzle at a distance. But these you can look at and you can see the parts and how they went together and touch them and um, tactile uh, sensations I think are a little bit different than than just totally visual things, you know. So all of these things are in that realm. Art history has a tradition of breaking down into schools and into patterns of people that work together and sort of bounced off ideas and bounced off uh, the art that they were making. It's very obvious that the New York School and the Abstract Expressionists and later the Pop Artists and later the Fluxus Artists and the East Village Artists and all of the New York groups that came out were bouncing off each other. And there was groups in Chicago and then there's Seattle and there's a few other places in America. That, that has these groups of rich artists. Well, in California, there's San Francisco, which has its groups of artists, and then it shakes down to this sort of one area in Los Angeles, the beach community, which back in the 60s was ironically the least expensive place to live. So artists were able to get studios on these streets with these incredibly beautiful buildings and pay hundreds of dollars, nothing, to be there. And, and Bill was part of that movement in the late 60s. He was next door to Ben Talbot, uh, John L. Toon, uh, all the artists that uh, Eric Orr, uh, they were all in this neighborhood and, and this was a group of artists that really played off each other. One of the main people was Wallace Berman who, who was sort of putting all the artists up at a high group and then of course many of them went to Ferris Gallery and they became the Ferris artists. But the, the, the intensity of, Ven of Venice was really um, noticeable as the center 
of the LA art scene and, and Bill was part of it from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and even today he's there in his Venice home working every day and uh, creating uh, new and um, amazingly beautiful art.